you jumped in at Lion King, and I think this is during the the Renaissance. Uh, Katzenberg brought in the Renaissance, uh, the animation Renaissance, because Disney animation was pretty much in the doghouse for for a while. It had been a long time since any majorly hit, big hit, had come out, and I think it started with Little Mermaid. Yes. And then jumped to, and then Beauty and the Beast was a monster hit. Then Aladdin came out. And I think, was Aladdin before? Aladdin was before Lion King, right? Yes, it was. Yes. Right. Uh, so, but then Lion King exploded. And then I think that was the peak of that renaissance. And then there were still a lot of good movies after it as well. A lot of, if you go back to Disney animation, you can apply the hero's journey to it. And you can apply the hero's journey to a lot of movies pre Star Wars. Sure. How do you, how do you, uh, like, how is that? No one really was taking the the hero's journey blueprint and going, okay, this is how I write the screenplay. But yet, when you go back to Casablanca, when you go back to to um, Citizen Kane, you go back to Hitchcock films, there are hero's journey elements in those. How is it just because it's literally programmed inside of our DNA? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, I think it's hardwired. Uh, it's baked into the human nervous system. This is what Campbell said. He said that we are wired to respond to certain scenes and images and ideas, and we respond in the organs of our body unconsciously. They just respond. Uh, when you, you see a fireman carrying somebody out of a fire or a mother holding a baby, cradling the baby in a triangular composition like those Virgin Mary things and uh, Isis holding the baby uh, uh, in the Egyptian mythology, uh, you just go, ah, you, you, you respond. You see an animal with big eyes looking up at you, you go, ah, you just, you can't help these physiological. Yeah, reactions. I mean, you look at, you look at Puss in Boots uh, in Shrek and then you just go, you just go like, oh, it's like, it's, you can't, <laughs> like it's a feeling inside you. You can't, even if your heart is a rock, you go inside. That's cute. Yeah, I thought it was it was brilliant, really, that they, they made use of that. All that cat does is turn and look at you, and the eyes get huge, and you go, ah, oh, you can't, you, you, whatever he's just done, you forgive him. You feel it's, sorry for him. So, so Campbell is ta tapping into these images and these kind of scenarios that are hardwired. Like you said, if someone's saving somebody else, you're going to feel something in real life or in a film or in a story. If, if, someone, if someone kicks the dog... <laughs> that is a specific feel. Like if you're hurting an animal, if you're hurting a child, if you're hurting someone that's weaker than you, instinctively in our core, we we generally feel the same. We all feel it, unless you're a bully too, and you go, "Hey, that's great that you kicked the dog." <laughs> but generally speaking, normal human beings um, have those innate feelings. And I think what you're saying in in the writer's journey, as well as what Joseph Campbell was saying is that if you can tap into those images, that kind of storytelling and incorporate it in your, in your films, in your scripts, you're just tapping into something that is universal. Yes. I, I think, uh, you know, the answer to your general question here has to do also with levels of consciousness. I think that the hero's journey um, was present and operative in filmmakers and storytellers from the very beginning. I mean, you go back to uh, the Odyssey and to Gilgamesh and, you know, the earliest things written are, are going to, you can open them up and you find there's that, this, that, and the other element of the uh, hero's journey. Uh, but people were not openly conscious of it. And I think that's the difference of the time we're living in, that because Partly, uh, my book and Campbell and the uh, notoriety and, and uh, notice that those things have gotten has moved these patterns up into consciousness a little bit more uh, so that even the audience is aware of them as meta patterns. And uh, they kind of have what's turned out is that people have a certain pleasure in finding them. And going, oh, yeah, I know that. That's the thing they did in Star Wars. or That's the thing they did in Superman. And uh, uh, there it is again, that people like to spot those patterns. So all of that, even the language of it, has come up more into consciousness. And for me, that's actually a bit of a danger because I don't want it to be completely conscious. I don't want right, the audience right. going, oh, yeah, step 13. Oh, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's the uh, blah, blah. Uh, I, I don't want them uh, thinking that. And I don't even want that when I'm watching something. Uh, I, I mean, I, I get a certain 
workman's pleasure in identifying step one, two, three, and, and you know, saying, oh, they're three minutes late on uh, revealing something. Um, but what's really fun for me is going to the movies and having no idea what's going to happen next and not knowing what's happening internally to my uh, organs of my body. Uh, just, just responding is wonderful. And then I might go back later and analyze it. But uh, I, I like to be just swept away by uh, a story that's unpredictable and, uh, you know, looks uh, maybe looks rough when you analyze it uh, by these standards. But, uh, but it still, it still can sing to you. Isn't it? I mean, it's so much tougher to be a writer today than it was five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, or 50 years ago, because the audiences are so much more educated in the process. I mean, I mean, in the 80s, uh, when I was when I was coming up, you know, and when I was working in my video store, uh, you know, I couldn't find behind the scenes of of movies, there was no DVD extras, there was no YouTube, there was nothing. So the information about the filmmaking process, let alone the storytelling process was there was just nothing there. But now you could just go on YouTube and find a thousand different, you know, people talking about uh, the hero's journey or the uh, or, or multiple different storytelling techniques and things like that. People have become so much more educated about the process. You, you know, how do you how do you suggest screenwriters work in, within that world? Because it is so much more difficult to do it. I mean, my feeling is that if you can execute the hero's journey perfectly really well it doesn't matter <laughs> that's my feeling i don't know what do you think yeah well i i think the key to all of this is to uh be aware that the audience does know a lot they are uh very well educated as you say but um you can still work uh with that and sometimes set them up you know to, okay I'm going to show you, here's a wizard, all right? And the wizard is nice, and he or she is going to help the hero, and they're going to give the hero. All this is doctrine according to the hero's journey. And then reveal not what you thought. The, the This person who seems to be helpful is actually working for the bad guys, trying to undermine the hero, uh, jealous of the hero, you know, some other unexpected twist so that it's always new again. And this is what I tell people is you are obligated as a filmmaker to know this set of instructions or patterns, uh, this and many others. This is not the only one. And, and I, in my own work, I, I don't exclusively use the hero's journey. There's lots of other ways to, uh, to do this. Uh, but, you know, to know the patterns and then deliberately break them somehow. Do something unexpected. Do something that that jumps out of the pattern, uh, like you know, referring to the mentor figures that I'm talking about. Uh, the the pattern sort of predicts that somewhere in the first act, one of these figures is going to show up, reassure the hero when he or she is afraid, give them something that helps them, and then they're uh, wheeled off, and that's the end of it. But uh, what if there isn't any figure like that and the hero is completely on his or her own and they have to go to internal sources? That's a different kind of dynamic. And it leaves a hole sometimes. That's one of the, the key ways to make this fresh and alive again, I think, is to leave some gaps. Um, and uh, there's a, a wonderful thing that I see filmmakers doing, which I'm, I'm very interested in this, which is sort of narrative compression where um, they take it for granted. The audience is quick and they can catch up and you can throw stuff in, in a series. Uh, you can start, and I've seen this uh, on Schitt's Creek, for example. Schitt's Creek will sometimes start bang deep in the middle of something. And you, you go, did I miss an episode? Because now they're talking about uh, the, the, maybe the parents are, I'm just making this up, but maybe the parents are talking about getting a divorce and it starts with the son and daughter going, oh, I'm really worried mom and dad are talking about getting a divorce. Uh, and you go, what? I didn't see that. Did I miss an episode? And then you realize, no, they're, they're trusting you as an audience that you can catch up and you can imagine those scenes that they left out. 
And I think that's uh, a healthy way to uh, approach things, is, is to kind of push to the edge of what the audience can keep up with uh, and, and uh, throw them some curveballs sometimes. Now, do you, you know, this is my feeling, I'd love to hear what you think, that, that the, the reason why the hero's journey has been so long lasting in our existence, I mean, it's, it's going back to as, as the oldest uh, stories uh, ever, rec ever written or recorded, it is basically an analogy for our own lives. It is, you know, we are all on our hero's journey. We are always, the, you know, everyone, no matter if you're the good guy or the bad guy, you are the hero of your own journey. I always like people like, Hitler didn't wake up thinking that he was the craziest madman in the world. He thought he was good. He thought he was the hero. So everyone has a perspective. So we're all heroes in our own journey. And there are the tricksters, the mentors, um, the, the, all these character archetypes that come into our lives and, and, and there are obstacles and we have our own dragons and we have our own things, sometimes internal, sometimes external, all these things. Is that, do you think, the reason why the hero's journey has lasted in our, in our existence for so long? Yeah, I think so. I think that it's um, a useful metaphor. It's one way to look at it is it's a kind of a lens that allows us to look at somebody else's situation, but read it back as reflective of us. And I think this is a real deep thing, that um, people are looking for themselves in their entertainment. They, they wanna see something that in some sense is about me, because people are profoundly self-centered and they wanna take in everything around them. Uh, you know, somebody walks into a room and they're dressed a certain way you can't help it. You compare yourself to them. Oh, she has better shoes than I do. Oh, they, they just got their hair cut. Oh, they have a nice bag. Oh, they're, you know, you, you, you measure all this stuff and, and you just do it unconsciously. Da, 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 da. It's like a, a, a mathematical formula that runs through your head. So we compare our behavior to that of other people. And what I've observed is if you are not hooked up to those characters, in some way, either they're like me or their plight is something I can relate to, or they desperately want something as I desperately want things, uh, then I just check out and I back away, almost literally back away from the screen. Uh, you know, I, I, I've learned a lot from watching audiences and how uh, when they're involved in the picture, they're more or less absolutely still and they're leaning forward. And if they are bored and detached, they start shifting around and they back away. Uh, so, you know, I, I think this is, is part of the, the key is to um, give people things in the characters that you want us to relate to that a lot of people can identify with, that they are the victims of misfortune, undeserved, uh, that they are uh, striving for something, wanting something. Uh, a good example is... Um, there's this new show just just coming out called Emily in Paris. Yeah, I heard about that. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, and uh, it's a beautiful show. It's lush. It's gorgeous. It's you know superficial, uh, beautiful uh, uh, salute to Paris and you know young uh, ambition and so forth. But um, in every show, every new show that that I look at, I'm trying to decide: Am I in this for the long run, or am I going to let it go after one or two episodes? And with that one. I had very little impulse to continue because they didn't do one essential thing in the first episode, which is tell me what that character wants. Yeah, right. you know, she didn't want anything. She was given a trip to Paris and she never expressed a desire to travel, a desire to go to Paris, a desire to, you know, we never saw her ambition to rise in the company. She just was like flooded with these gifts from heaven and is walking around in awe about, about Paris. And uh, you could guess that she had the general desire of every young person to uh, succeed or, or to have an adventure. But uh, it, it, she never said it. It wasn't expressed. Nobody around her said it. Uh, so I found myself not, not really involved. So I think this, this is, uh, you know, important to uh, let people know what what does a character want as soon as I know what they want I want it for them and I have now almost merged my personality with theirs 
even if, if it's a villain and the villain is trying to undermine society, I, I'm kind of going, oh, he he almost lost his chance to undermine society. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you, know you, you automatically plug in.